Hey, if I've not met you, my name is Peyton. I am the uh, lead pastor here. If you're a student, you can head on towards the back. This is my favorite part because we just get done with this incredible time of worship. And then like half the auditorium leaves full of students. What they don't realize is they're missing the best part. Let me tell you what's really cool about what just happened is, I don't know how many that was, but that was a bunch. And then what that does is that leaves a bunch of empty seats in here. So those of you who don't have someone sitting beside you, it could represent a student or it could represent someone that you need to be bringing here. So either way, that empty seat represents a life, and I'm, I'm grateful for what's happening in that ministry. Hey, today we are starting a two-week mini-series. This is our shortest series ever, a two-week mini-series, and the whole idea behind it is we are moving to multiple services two weeks from today, and I want to just uh, help prepare you all for the season that we're heading into and I think that God has a timely word for us this morning. And what I want to do is I want to parallel the table to the church. Now, let me ask you, those of you, when you eat dinner or lunch or breakfast, how many of you sit at the table with your family? Some of you? Well, I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up sitting at the table for sure. I, that was the last thing that I was doing was sitting at the table. But what I've, and I don't even know where it comes from, but my wife and I and, and, and our children, nine times out of ten, if we're eating a meal, it doesn't mean it doesn't matter if it's peanut butter and jelly or steak fajitas. We tend to sit at the, uh, the table. And the table, what happens there is conversations and life and, and community, and, and you're, just, you're just together there in a moment of intimacy. And there's a lot of scripture in the New Testament about Jesus sitting at the table with people and sharing a meal with them. And during first century, it was a really big deal to sit at the table with people. A really big deal. And so for, for part one of this installment... I want to talk with you about the messy table, and I want you to keep in mind that the table correlates to the church, the messy table. How many of you, when you sit at the table, it gets messy? How many of you are messy? How many of you are lying right now and don't want to raise your hand? That's the majority of you. I had two people up here just like barely T-Rex raised their hand. You come to my house or you go out to eat with me and my wife and my two kids, I don't care what we're eating or where we're going. It's getting messy. In fact, what started happening now is I feel so guilty that I start tipping the waitress really good now because I just know that she's going to have a heck of a mess to pick up. I mean, it's broken plates, spilled drinks, chips in the floor. You know, half of, you know, my son Jude, his, his entree, half of it will be in the floor. And, and, you know, that's 10 bucks down the drain. So it just gets messy with this. It gets messy if you come out with the wheels or you come over to the wheels. And the same is true for church. When you bring people to the table of God, to the house of God, it's going to get messy. Do you know why? Because we are all messy. We all have some table manners that we need to work on. But the beautiful thing about what we're going to see today is that Jesus, in spite of our mess, invites us to sit at the table. And one of the things that I want to challenge you is to be thinking about who is it that you can be inviting to the table? Two weeks from today, let me hear for a moment. Two weeks from today, we're switching to two services. We're going to be going from 9.30 to 11. And you see these empty seats. Now, a lot of them, granted, were the students that just walked out. But there's some people in your life that need to be brought to the table. And I think the story that we're going to see today will help you understand the importance of inviting people to the table. But you've got to invite people to the table if you're going to share a meal together. In fact, after the service, here's this is a graphic that we're going to be, uh, you can go ahead and go to that one. It won't be exactly like this. It'll be the individual times. But, so it'll say, join me at City Lights, 9.30 a.m., or join me at City Lights at 11 a.m. And an easy way for you to begin inviting people to these services that we're having, that we're moving to, is by, uh, we're going to, our digital team will, after the service, are going to post these separate graphics on our social media page to our digital album. You can go there and download it, and you can send a text to somebody. You can post it on their wall. You can send it in a message. You can change it to your Facebook banner, whatever you want to do. But that's one simple way that we want to help you invite somebody to the table of what God is doing here. Those will be posted immediately after the service, a little bit after the service. Keep your eye out for those. And that's one way that you can be inviting people. Here's the next thing. If the church is a table where life happens and it gets messy and we're supposed to be inviting and sharing, then we've also got to set the table, right? We've got to set the table. At my house, we tend to eat off of... Uh, Paper plates a lot because dishes aren't that cool. And um, that's no knock to my wife. She dropped her head right here. Um, 
you got to set the table. You got to have silverware. You got to have plates. You got to have drinks. You got to have everything that you need for those that you've invited. And let me tell you why I think that we are setting the table just right. We literally have a place for everybody under the sun here to get connected. If that's a city group, if that's student ministry, a volunteer team, the worship team, and now we're offering multiple services. And I want to just help somebody ask me this. I want to make sure I bring clarity. Those will be identical services, by the way. So it's not like the 930 will be one type and the 11 will be the other. They're going to be identical, so you can choose either one. But we are setting the table for God's people to come and share a meal with us. We believe that we've set it right to share this meal. In Luke chapter 5, don't, not just yet. In Luke chapter 5, there's this incredible story about Jesus, and he's walking by, and he's going to call a guy named Levi, whose name would later be changed to Matthew. And something really, I think, is going to stick out to us about, one, who is, who is Jesus inviting to the table? What does it mean to look like? What does it look like to set the table for that type of person? And then I'm going to challenge you with something at the end that every one of us is going through in here. This is Luke chapter 5. Verse 27, Jesus has been walking around. He's been healing people. He's been calling other, other disciples. And it says, later, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi. Now, Levi would go on to be Matthew, sitting at this, excuse me, sitting at his tax collector's booth. Listen to the simplicity of what Jesus said to him. He said, follow me and be my disciple. That is the simplicity of an invitation to follow Jesus. Follow me and be my disciple. I've shared this thought before in this feeling and I'm convinced of it because I've experienced it and truth be known in my past, I have done it. But we make it incredibly difficult for people to follow Jesus sometimes. We put so much religion, so many rules and regulation and that's what the Savior of the world said. Hey, just come follow me. Come follow me. And look what happens in verse 28. It says, so Levi got up because when Jesus is calling, we must respond, right? We must respond. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And I want to clarify to you all that when it says that he left everything, this is not a universal call to poverty to follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that you literally, that Jesus is asking you to leave everything behind to follow him. What it does show is that we don't have to have everything together, but we better be ready to leave some things to follow Jesus. It should cost us something. Verse 29, it says, Later, I love this. We don't know how much later, but in context, we would imagine at the most a couple hours later. Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. And I want to ask you this question because it shook me to my core this week as I've been preparing for this. In your home, At your table, is Jesus the guest of honor? Is Jesus the guest of honor in your home? Or is he an afterthought? Is he a Facebook invite? And then sometimes I'm thinking, honestly, just the way that we operate here, are we always keeping Jesus at the center and the foundation of what we do? Is Jesus our guest of honor here? One of our most sincere prayers at City Lots is that anytime we gather, if you're watching online, digitally, or you're here physically, that you would leave this place, this experience, more impressed with Jesus, way more than anything that we do, communicate, say, or do, because He is the one that we honor here. He is the one we honor. And it says that many of Levi's fellow tax collectors, let me hear, and other guests, also ate with him. So let me, let me help you understand what's going on here. Basically, you could sum it up as Jesus walks by Levi, invites him to follow him. Levi commits his life to him, so he experiences salvation in that moment. And then perhaps, maybe, just an hour or two later, now he's hosting this big banquet. He's inviting Jesus into his home to share this meal. And what I love about it, though, is that Levi is saved, if you will. He's committed to following Jesus, but he still has all his worldly buddies with him. He still has all his drinking buddies and his going out buddies and his card game buddies because how many of you know, just because you commit to following Jesus, it doesn't make everything better immediately. You get there. It says, many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. Verse 30. It says, but the Pharisees, now these were the religious leaders back then. It says, the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly. How many of you know that church people are really good at complaining bitterly about things? 
right? It's the craziest thing to me. In fact, it's almost a little appalling sometimes when I'm with people that are cross followers and I hear them complain about some of the things that they complain about. But these Pharisees and their teachers of the religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Don't miss this question. Why do you, leave me here please, why do you eat and drink with such scum? That's the church people saying that. That's the church people saying that. And I got to thinking about this. Are you surprised that Jesus would sit at a table with a bunch of scum people? You shouldn't be. That wasn't a trick question. Some of y'all, I don't know if you're like serious or you thought I was going to trick you. But it shouldn't, be any, it shouldn't be a surprise at all that he would sit at a table with such people. Because Jesus always chose the lowly, the weak, the brokenhearted, the least of these. I asked this question during our volunteer service. How many of you, like growing up, or you know, maybe in your neighborhood, I, I grew up in a neighborhood where there was tons of kids, so we played this, or maybe it was, you know, at, at an elementary school. But how many of you grew up playing like backyard football, you know, baseball, basketball, different games like that, where there was always two captains that chose the teams, right? Anybody remember that? Yeah. Some of you have bad feelings about it, I can tell already. <laughs> what did that team, what did those team captains always do? They picked the best players first, right? Until the last sad loser stood there and was forced to join a team, right? Now, if I'm bringing up any old feelings, forgive the preacher this morning, okay? I'm taking y'all back to the playground where you were picked last. It's supposed to be therapeutic. We talked about that. That doesn't really change when it comes to being an adult. We still have that mindset of, I'm a captain. I want the best. I want bigger things. I got to have this image. I got to have this persona. But that's not what Jesus did at all. What Jesus did was he was the team captain and he chose first those who would be last. And that's what you see here with Levi and every other person he's called. And so it's only fitting for the king of the world to sit at a table with the scum of the world. And it drove these Pharisees crazy. Why would you sit with such scum and eat and drink with them? It reminds me of there was this, uh, this, this kid in high school, and you know who I'm talking about, and you, you had him, and hopefully you weren't the one, but this person was just always picked on and bullied, and no one ever, ever wanted to sit with them. Do you know what I'm talking about? I can remember particularly a, a, a guy in middle school. No one ever wanted to sit with him. And I can remember one day just like somehow in my youth, in my hormonal adolescence, having some compassion for this guy. And just going and choosing to sit with him. His name was Brandon. He lives in Ohio. He's about 6'6 now and he's a cop. You think that's a coincidence? But just having that compassion to, I'm going to go sit with him because there's something about when we sit at a table together, it's intimate. You ever go out to friends? You ever go out to eat with someone that you don't really know and you sit at a table? Awkward, right? Because you don't know how to have conversations. You don't eat like a pig like you normally do. So you're just barely, you know, eating half bites. There's something about sitting at the table. And what I love about this is that it's so fitting that Jesus would sit at a table with people such as this. Let me tell you something about City Lights, what I want to be. I want us to be and have a table that welcomes all people. And I'm not just talking about welcome, okay? Because that's a, that's a pretty generic church statement. All are welcome. Yeah, all are welcome. And can I just be really real with you this morning? And I mean this. I understand that we are not a church for everybody. But I assure you, we are a church for anybody. And we will welcome the scum. And let me just be even a little bit more really real with you. That's me. Compared to the holiness and the goodness of God, I am scum compared to Him. Is how I feel sometimes. I share this. The more I get to know Him, the farther away I feel I am from Him. The more I begin to follow Him, the more I realize I act like nothing like Him. And so why do you eat with such scum? And you know that there are Pharisees in the church today. There are people who would say, my church is for everybody. 
But the moment somebody comes in looking a little bit different, they get a little extra glance. And I know there are people here at this church that have felt that way at other churches, and I'm not knocking any church specifically. But you know it. You walk in, and the eyes cut you by the way you dress or the way you look or how many tattoos you have or what color your hair is. That's what the church ought to be complaining about is that we're judging people by the way they look. It's ridiculous that someone can't walk in somewhere and just be who they are. Man, and the Lord stirred this thought in me so long ago. And right now I'm talking to somebody. I'm talking to somebody that has felt like scum or you feel like scum because of decisions you've made. Scum is a weird word, isn't it? I just realized that once I said it three times in a row. I'm talking to somebody that feels down, listen, that feels dirty, that feels used up, wondering if you could be, would Jesus walk by your table and ask you to follow him? And I thought that the Lord laid in my heart years ago was that if Jesus was concerned about being guilty by association, he would have never, he would have never, ever left heaven. Do you know that? If he was concerned about your dirtiness and the scum that you are, he would have never left heaven. I remember that shook me because sometimes I feel less than. I feel like the least of these. I feel like the scum at the table. I feel like everybody at the table is better than me. And I'm so grateful that Jesus would come down as divinity, in the form of a man, so that I can know him. Luke 5.31. Jesus answered, I love that he can handle any kind of question we have to ask him. Jesus answered them, listen, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. So they've asked, why do you eat with such scum? Now he answers them. Verse 32. He says, I have come to call, I love this right here, not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. The day that I committed my life to Christ, I knew that I was a jacked up sinner. I continue to follow Christ and find His redemption because I repent knowing that I am a jacked up sinner. And what happens is Jesus is sitting at this table. We're sitting at this church. We're gathered around the table. And you can't see it, but it's messy in here. It's messy. On our best day, we come here and we bring a bunch of mess to the table. Amen? Amen. And we're just thankful that our mess isn't in the form of a dish that we have to actually lay down because then we'd all be embarrassed if we saw each other's mess. I know I'd be embarrassed if you saw mine. And so I want you to think about what happens then on a weekly basis. Every one of us come in here to the table, the messy table, invited, the table set for worship, for city kids, for a message. And you and I bring a bunch of mess in here to this table. And we're like, okay, God, we're here to honor you and to hear from you. I want, I want to show you something. My wife doesn't know this, but I'm going on vacation after this message. <laughs> I'm kidding. I take you with me, baby. Here's how I feel when it comes to the messy table and every week what we're doing. As we prepare to move into multiple services, what I'm saying is, The table is going to get messy, and these are the type of people that we should be inviting. Every one of us is messy, and every one of us has baggage, just like Levi. Do you understand that Levi, what he was doing was, two hours before he invited Jesus into his house to this banquet, he was basically extorting money from his own people. He was a thief. Not exactly, because there's some laws now, but he is the equivalent to an IRS man, right? You familiar with them? Okay. Jesus goes by this, and they listen, tax collectors were despised back then. 
despised because they took from their own. They took off the top and stuck it in the bottom. They cheated. They were despised. And Jesus walks by him and says, hey, you're the one that I want. Out of everybody he could have chose, and I think about out of, you know, seven, eight billion people in the world right now, if you're in this room, the Father chooses you. And so Levi, when he hosts this banquet, hours after stealing money from people, Jesus comes in and sits with him. So I wanted to remind somebody, you feel like your hours being clean, your hours from being angry or depressed or giving your body away, your hours away from those thoughts of depression and anger and turmoil, And I love that Jesus still sat with Levi, even after that. And so here's what happens. Go ahead and get a little music going there. Let's go ahead and bring the lights down to it. Every one of us, we come to the table every week with baggage. A lot. Some of us have more than others. Some of y'all need a bigger bag than this. Some of y'all need a couple bags like this. Levi that day, he hosted this banquet because he fell in love with the Savior and he made him the guest of honor. At City Lights, we are madly in love with Jesus and we want him to be the one we honor. And we invite every week people to the table. We set the table. But what happens when we come is it becomes a messy table. And here's what happens. This is an invisible baggage that we bring. Sometimes it's you can see it on your... And we come in here. We come to worship. And we've got all this baggage, right? And we bring to the table the dish of being depressed. We have a big potluck here at City Lots, and this is what you bring. Right? And you just then you sit that on your table and you're like, okay, God, here I am. I'm ready to I'm ready to have a meal with you. And others of you. You come in here with your baggage and you pull out your side of addiction. And let me clarify. I'm not talking about just drugs and alcohol. I'm talking to the person who's addicted to attention in here. If you don't get it, you chase it down. You're addicted to your image. You're addicted to a person. You come in, nobody sees it except God. And you bring it down, you sit at the table, and you're like, all right, God, here I am. Then others of you come in, you bring your baggage, and at your core, the best thing that you can bring in is just a whole bunch of brokenness. I mean, broken, jacked up, scum, feeling. And you come in and you sit your gift down. Like, all right, God, here I am and let's go to worship today. I'm ready to hear some good music and I want to hear a word from the Lord, but you're so broken. And you're wondering, is he going to sit with me today at the table? And others of you, you you come in and you can hardly look anybody in the eye because you're so insecure about yourself because you're placing value on places and things instead of the person of who you are you're so insecure to make any kind of decision that you wind up making no decision which furthers your insecurity and you sit your your gift down your meal and you're like alright God here I am y'all got a lot of baggage 
And there's some of you in here. And your heart is just filled with sorrow. Your heart's just filled with sorrow. And maybe you don't even know why. Or maybe it's a thousand reasons why. I shouldn't have done this. Or I shouldn't have done that. Or I'll, I'll tell you what can get me feeling sorrowful sometimes. And it's just a confession. I begin to think about decisions I've made or conversations I've had with my wife or how I neglected my kids or how I could have done a little bit more sermon prep for a message or how I could have been a little bit more kind to that stranger, how I could have taken that phone call. And I just begin to get filled with sorrow. And I come in here and I preach. I say, all right, God, here I am. All the while, you don't know the baggage that I'm carrying. And then last, but certainly not least, for those of you who have not been able to identify because you live on some other planet, perhaps the most dangerous baggage that you bring to the table every single week that we gather, perhaps more dangerous than addiction, perhaps more dangerous than a promiscuous life, perhaps more detrimental than a person walking around depressed who can't get out of bed is the very person who thinks they are righteous. And you don't even know you bring this baggage to the table. And you come in and here's what happens. Here we all sit at the table a freaking hot mess. Just some of us, and we're some of us, I believe this sincerely. We desperately we bring this baggage in, and we desperately want to know: is he going to sit with such scum as me? Am I going to hear from him today? Is he going to love me? Am I going to be able to get anything out of this? Could God love someone like me with a problem like this? And this is what we bring every single week. And I want to remind you or inform you for the very first time that anytime you bring a bunch of messy people to a messy table, our church will be messy. Do you know why? Because this is what you bring to the table every single week, you and I both. The good news is this, that Jesus did not come to save those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. So we gather every day at the table, every week. We bring our, our sorrow, our shame, our guilt, addiction, depression, pride, and say, God, here we are. This is what we have. Do something in us that only you can do. And it gets messy. And what we need to begin doing and continue doing at City Lots is this. We would be a group of people that don't try to fix people's mess, but point them towards the Messiah, the one who can. And I would tell you this, that Jesus did not come to make messy people tidy. He came to redeem sinners. So if you're feeling messy and you're a jacked up sinner, He came to redeem you. I told our volunteers this a little while ago. That a lot of times I get in these moments and I say stuff and I'm jacked up and I'm fired up. And then I'll, like, I'll go back and watch the live stream and I'm thinking, God, why did I say that? You know what I mean? but I can't live like that. So what I'm saying is I put a lot of thought in what I'm fixing to say until I go back and watch it on Tuesday. <laughs> May we always be a church. Always. That will pursue a messy table. As you think about us moving into this new season of ministry, multiple services, reaching new people and more people. I mean this, okay? I mean it. If Jesus would come for the least of these, that's who He sought after. Then if you know someone that thinks they're righteous, if you know someone that's filled with this right here and not willing to repent, I promise you,
I'll take a church full of these people right here any day. Jesus came for the least of these, that which we are, the least of these. And every week we're preparing a table, we're inviting, and it's going to get messy. The good news is, I'm messy with you. Jesus is calling a group of people that are messy, that have so much baggage, so much baggage, to come sit at the table. And you know what blows me away? I think about this. And if you're not, if you're not, here's another thing. You don't know where my heart's at when I get up here and preach, okay? You don't know the things that the God is, is speaking in me, and I want to share some of those with you. But sometimes He's doing things in me personally and privately that I don't want to share publicly because He's my God. So if you're not if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, if you're not feeling what I'm feeling, this is not really going to be a big deal to you. But if you're feeling like you've got a lot of baggage and you can relate to me, then this will speak something to you. It's the simplicity of it. It amazes me, Chris. It amazes me, Jessica, that Jesus would walk into a room like this and sit at a table with a guy like me. guy like me who sits at the table with me you want to sit at a table with me Jesus in spite of me in spite of my depression and brokenness and insecurity and you would sit with me the answer is yes but not because of me because of him So that's why we invite to the table. Oh, now it makes sense. That's why we set the table. Not really for you, but for Him to come sit with you, to stand with you. Because it's a reckless love that pursues us. It's a love that chases us down. It's a love that leaves the 99. I want you to just think about this. When was the last time you hosted a banquet for Jesus and made him a guest of honor? Now, I don't want to get all churchy and I don't want to get all spiritual, but I'm just being honest. Maybe the banquet that you need to host is right here. And you need to invite him to be the guest of honor because at the messy table, he still chooses to sit with you pursue you as we sing this song I want you to think about how reckless you are I'm not talking about when you're flying down Charles Sievers Boulevard and you try to beat the yellow light before it gets red I want you to think about somebody listen this is why I'm going because I feel the spirit in me led to speak this my clock says I'm over it's zero time left but that I'm the boss here so I get to keep talking but I feel the one who's in charge of me leading me to say this because I know how I feel and there's got to be some people here with me this morning. I want you to think about how reckless your thoughts are. A prime example would be, what if I, what if we could just pull out everything you've thought of in the past 30 minutes while I've been preaching? Would that be messy? Anybody honest in here, would that be messy? Y'all think I have like a supernatural power right now, don't you? That's why the screen's blank because blank, we're going to pull it up. Think about how reckless you are. Listen, I'm talking to the married couple in here. Who, you're committed to your spouse. You love them. You thank God for them. Come on, be honest. How reckless are you with them? How reckless are you? How cruel can you be when you know that she needs compassion? Women, how repetitive can you be when you know he only needs to hear it one time? That was a joke. Think about how reckless you can be. Moms and dads, think about how, think about how restless, reckless you can be with your kids. The very thing that you would swear you'd give your life for 
being reckless with. How can that be? This is why. And so I walk around sometimes in my life and I just feel so reckless the way that I treat people. I feel so reckless about the way I treat myself. I feel so reckless about the way that I pursue the Father. But in turn, how many of you know that you met your match in Jesus? You can't outrun Him. You can't outhide Him. There's no shadow He won't light up. There's no mountain He won't climb up. There's no wall He won't kick down coming after you. So I just want us to think about this for a moment. This is the reckless love of God as we come to this messy table. And you know this, what you bring to Him, only He could do what He does in you. Only He could do it. Not you. Not Ariel. Not Jude. Not Harper. Not JB. Not the sound team. Only Jesus Christ can do what He is doing in me. Only Him. Because I'm a mess.